And so before we continue to study our inheritance, the unchanging epigraph of the study of our inheritance in Jesus Christ is the book of Luke 24. 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, so that we, as the participants of the body of Christ, would share together with Christ all the things that are to be fulfilled that are written about him in Scripture. We will continue to study our collaboration with the truth of the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit, looking at what we need to do from our side to receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can put on the new way of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created in accordance to God and true righteousness and holiness. To fulfill this commanding order, we, as we know, have been studying three vital, charging, and fundamental acts. And these are to put off, be renewed, and put on. We've noted that it is specifically your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting acts, to put off, be renewed, and put on, that will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. More specifically, will the coming about of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it forever, which will then result in our names being forever blotted out of the book of life, although they may have been written there at one time? It's unfortunate and sorrowful that the salvation of God that is offered in many churches, it's not offered in the format of a guarantee. It is offered as a finished work of salvation, and people are convinced that they have received a salvation not in the format of a guarantee, but as something concrete and specific, and that they are already saved, and not only that, but are pretty much they don't have any way out of it they will be saved either way and this is not true everything that God gives he gives in the format of a seed and seed is not fruit so that we have the fruit of salvation we need to grow this seed we need to invest it or turn it to profit we need the seed to die that you receive in yourself so that it bear fruit this will be the salvation when it will be given in the format of fruit but we don't receive it in the format of fruit we receive it in the format of a seed and according to the norms of scripture any promise that we hear about we receive in the format of a seed and we need to grow it in the soil of our heart and only afterwards will it become our own when it will grow into the tree of life that will bear its fruit 12 times every month giving its fruit. In a specific format, we've already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we can begin the process of clothing ourselves into the, into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God, in Christ Jesus, in righteousness and holy truth relevant to clothing ourselves into the power of our new person who contains the power of the resurrection of Christ and the all armor of light we've concluded that we really need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy the means of receiving any kind of help this help demonstrated in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is the armor of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth we have noted that the genesis of prayer is inherent to the genesis of God as it's always existed and revealed itself where God abides communication of the Heavenly Father with His Son and the Holy Spirit happen in worship. It's by prayer and the extent or degree of our knowledge of the will of God which we are studying in the three functions 
to put off the old man, be renewed by the spirit of our mind, and clothe ourselves into our new person absolutely depends on the extent of our understanding of the genesis of prayer. Prayer is the language of God, the means given to us by God, and the legitimate right to communicate with God. This is specifically why erecting an altar identifying the state of the heart and prayer or motive a worship of a worshiper of God, as well as the sacrifice that is brought upon such an altar, identifying the legit and rightful status of prayer, belonged exclusively to those people that were clothed into the rightful virtue and status of a priest. In other words, those people who have left spiritual infancy and have grown into full, full measure of growth in Christ. A person that is clothed into the rank and virtue of a priest is a person that is clothed into the virtue of a legitimate median. This person is trusted by God with the right, by the means of legitimate prayer that satisfies the demands of his will and what is his language, to approach God and enter into the presence of God in order to present his rights and his interests that are demonstrated in his will. One of these prayers of David, David is written in the 143rd Psalm, and the Psalm opens up the conditions based upon which a person is called to form a legitimate foundation for God so that God's mercy may intervene into our life as well as the boundaries of those areas we rule over and that we carry responsibility for before God. The Psalm has become the subject of our next studies. This prayer I trust has become our common prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me and in your righteousness. And do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I I meditate on the days of old. I remember all the works of your hands. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies, in you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul for I am your servant. Psalm 143, 1 through 12. The phrase, as we know, caused me to hear loving kindness in the morning, indicates the early morning that follows the dark night. In scripture, this symbolizes the resurrection of Christ, which we can see in the law of the spirit of life, which is called to deliver our body from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life is within the new person. The law of sin and death is within the body. And he, the law, the law of sin and death, the law of Moses, what does it do? It discovers sin within our body. It reveals it and gives power to sin. When does this happen? When we're born from the Lord. When we're born from the seed of the word of truth. And the Holy Spirit comes to us, and the first that he does, he sees in the body the stronghold of death, this reigning sin, and he immediately, from our spirit, he turns to him in the status of the law of Moses. It discovers the sin inside and gives power to it because the law of the spirit of life is not called to discover the sin, it's called to destroy sin, not notice sin, and not pay attention to sin. God has reconciled the world to himself, not accounting the sins of men to them. He sees the sin but does not account this sin to, to man. This is in the new person, and the new person doesn't have sin. We're born from God, and the nature of our new person is inherent to God's nature, which is why there, the law of Moses cannot be there. The law of the spirit of life is there, but when this law of the spirit of life 
is within our body, then in our body it discovers this old person and sin and gives power to sin. And so we are called by the law of the spirit of life that is within the new person to destroy, eradicate the stronghold of death within our body and erect within our body the stronghold of life. This is the work of the new person. This is God's goal that has been placed for our new person. And, but in order for our new person to be able to start fulfilling his obligation, he needs to be gro grown into full measure of growth in Christ. And for him to grow is something is what depends on us. We need to do something for this to happen. This is not given freely. The guarantee of salvation is given freely. Our nation. We need to leave our nation, the house of our Father, our corrupt desires, die in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for these three uh, aspects of our life and when we die for them then the new person finally has the right and opportunity to begin battle and resist the old person but before this no battle will happen infants spiritual infants think that their old person is as the Holy Spirit or they consider him as the Holy Spirit everything that the the old person speaks uh, and uses their w desires their uh, wants they think that it's the Holy Spirit and they make these decisions um, with their mind instead of their heart because they're not able to discern with their heart spiritual infants if they in the appointed by God time that he has given to each person will not leave and come out of this uh, spiritual infancy then they will destroy themselves forever and will transform themselves into antichrists haters of Christ and so a legitimate foundation upon the tablets of our heart in the given prayer are ten unique in their nature arguments identifying the governing and almighty words of God converted into promises as an inheritance and commandments that we need to present to God as the consistency of our heart telling God hear me in your faithfulness and your righteousness why does God need to hear uh, hear me say this hear me according to your will and his will will is hear me for the sake of remembering the days of old and all of your works hear me because all of your works that you have done for my salvation are within my heart we are telling him to hear us see what's within my heart pretty much hear me see what's in my heart your entire will all of your commandments have been put in there look inside hear me for I spread out my hands to you when something happens to me I spread my hands out to you hear me for in you do I trust I have destroyed that I previously relied upon hoped upon I can no longer rely upon my nation the house of my father I can't trust upon or my abilities not my intelligent abilities or of the of the will I've died for them I am naked before you I only have yours because it's not possible to trust upon God if you have at least something that you're still trusting upon until the final uh, pillars are destroyed that you trust upon that you rely on you can't trust upon God hear me for I lift up my soul to you hear me because in you I take shelter hear me for you are my God hear me for your name's sake hear me for your righteousness sake and hear me because I am your servant in the previous services we already looked at the nature of the first argument and stopped to study the second argument this is evidence that David's heart contained memories of the days of old as in our hearts we have memories of the days of old and all of the works that were done by God in those old days that we in our worship confess and present in prayer we've noted the symbol of this evidence in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest which is an item of unique and continual remembrance before God identifying with itself the legitimate example of continual prayer with which we as kings and priests of the new covenant are to approach God in Jesus Christ and continuously abide in communication with him a continual prayer continuous communication that is not that isn't being inter interrupted by sin 
And so we've noted that this breastplate of judgment was created for and served only one element, a sacral element within the heart of man, the Urim and the Thummim, the presence of which allowed God to hear man and allowed man to hear God. First, these names uh, made us nervous uh, when we just started talking about these things. How is it I can have an Urim and Thummim? I don't understand what this Urim and Thummim. Many people approached me and asked, tell me, what are these again and again? Today we clearly understand what they are. We know that the Thummim is the truth, the teaching of Jesus Christ, and the Urim is the Holy Spirit that reveals the truth that is in your heart. And so the symbol of the breastplate of judgment is the only item, uh, it was the only perfect item as it was square in shape. The rest were rectangular, but this one was square. And so this is the symbol of the conscience of a man cleansed from dead works upon the tablets of whom in the twelve names of the patriarchs who are the destiny prepared by God for us. In them are the promises of God, these patriarchs, these 12 patriarchs. It isn't just their names, these are our destinies. These are God's promises that are within these names. They identify the status of legitimate prayer that satisfies the demands of the elementary principles of Jesus Christ. The twelve golden settings is the government and order of God contained in the principles of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. It identifies the order of God that we as worshippers of God are called to demonstrate before the face of God in the legitimate foundation of our continual prayer. In other words, we need to present prayer that needs to satisfy God's demands, demands of the words of God, the scriptures. The twelve precious stones with engraved upon them as a signet names of the sons of Israel is a symbol and format of our continual prayer presenting with itself the perfect judgments of God contained in the elementary principles of Jesus Christ. With this we conclude that it wasn't the golden settings in the form of the truth of the word of God that were adjusted in size and configuration to the precious stones but the precious stones uh, in the form of our prayers are the ones that were adjusted in size and configuration to fit the golden settings of truth. If they will not be uh, configured, then this precious stone will not be able to be fitted or placed into God's will. God has given his, uh, his settings in the way that it needs to be and our prayer needs to be fitting to that. The settings themselves were made first and then the stones were adjusted to fit those settings. Which is why the revelation of God in the form of the Urim can only exist within the boundaries of the truth which is the Thummim in the heart of a man demonstrating the principles of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. As it is written, I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31.6 We've noted that the friendship of the Thummim and Urim within the heart of a person is the unification of two formats of godly wisdom. They state that the carriers of the Thummim and Urim are the true worshippers of God and the most amazing is that they possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you are not able to be touched. Anyone who touches you, to do something bad to you or evil to you will be cursed. Anyone who tries to bless you will be blessed. Anyone who tries to curse you will be cursed. In a specific format, we've already looked at seven qualities that the heart of a warrior in prayer possesses in the first seven precious stones of the breastplate of judgment by which God can continually bring about his will upon planet Earth. And we stopped to study the eighth quality and the eighth precious stone upon the breastplate of judgment of our heart presented in the virtue of the precious agate stone. The name carved upon the second precious stone of the breastplate of judgment located in the third row from the bottom upon the tablets of our heart being a continual memorial before God is the name of Asher. He is the eighth son of Jacob and his name means a captive of blissfulness or blessing. Leah's servant 
Zilpah uh, bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, How happy I am. The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. Genesis 30, 12-13. We will remember that when translated from the Greek word agat, it means blessed, which absolutely corresponds to the meaning of the name Asher, written upon the stone, a captive of blissfulness or blessing. The name of God presented in the precious agate, according to the conclusions of the Jewish rabbinate, is El El Yon, which means most high. This directs to the unlimited and sovereign authority or power of God in his unlimited expanse which he fills with himself due to his omnipresence as well as the created by him visible and invisible creation. According to the definitions of the name of Asher that is written upon the precious agate stone, the eighth fundamental principle contained in continual prayer with which we need to come to God in our prayer as the function demonstrated in our voluntary dependence. This is our voluntary dependence to become blessed captives of God. So we are capable of collaborating our prayer with the name of God, El Elyon, or God Most High. Relevant to the subject, we have already studied a series of parables and events that we became familiar with and their conditions. We learned that we can fulfill these conditions by the name of God Most High and destroy the stronghold of death within our body in the form of the reigning sin that is in it. This reigning sin identifies the essence of our old person with his deeds so that we would cast him from out of our body to hell with noise and afterwards erect the stronghold of the kingdom of heaven in the form of the stronghold of eternal life in the place of the stronghold of death within our body and stop to look at the next condition this condition consists in the 18th psalm of david where the holy spirit with the right that he alone has reveals the conditions based upon which we are called to collaborate our faith prayer with the name of god El Elyon, or God Most High. And this condition consists in the circumstances of our hardship while putting off the old man when we will leave the position of infancy, spiritual infancy, we can call upon the Most High as to our God and confess the faith of our heart and state who God is to us in Christ Jesus, what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, and who we are for God in Christ Jesus. When we begin the prayer, Our Father, we say, Our Father, we tell Him who we are to Him, that we are His children, because He is our Father. Not in many religions can you call God your Father, the only re religion or say faith, uh, where God, uh, people call God their father is the faith of Israel. Only were they able to call God their father when one of the respectable women from the Muslim nation received Jesus Christ. The first thing she was uh, amused by is she said, I dare to call him my father. This is how she titled her book, where she explains what prompted her to leave the Muslim faith and turn to Christianity. Allah, he is a judge, and that's all he is. He is God the judge who created the world, and they are not familiar with mercy. They, as in the law of Moses, you need to earn everything with your deeds. You need to do something. But here, she became familiar with the father that had already done everything for his children and provided for. And now he wants his children to learn to be like him. There, they're trying to do something, but they will never ever be in his likeness. To be in his likeness, you need to be born from him. Because not a single religion has people that are born again from their father, from their God. Further, we've noted that this allegory is one of the most powerful and voluminous symbols where we see the collaboration of our renewed mind in the form of King David and the name of God Most High, and also the confrontation of our renewed mind with our carnal mind in the form of King Saul, together with the reigning sin in the form of our old person with his deeds. We already looked at this, that within our body, 
in this kingdom of God. This is his house. This is his city. This is his temple. There are two kings anointed by God, King Saul anointed by God and King David simultaneously because the one and the other are anointed. Why did God not anoint David earlier because he was still a child? He was an infant in Christ, but in order to keep the body, control the body, because this is God's holiness, God anoints in his wrath the mind of man, because God has wrath uh, kindled against the mind of man, because the mind of man confronts God and tries to interpret the scriptures. Uh, and God is angered at that, but he still anoints the mind. I've given you a king in my anger, he says. And he rejected him in his wrath. And when the time came to anoint David, when the human mind had become too proud, when God commands him to do one thing and he does another, and not only that, but conflicts with God, as, Sa uh, as Saul did with Samuel, then God said to Samuel, tell him that the end of his kingdom has come, I have rejected him. And Samuel cried the entire night, he mourned. He did not yet know that God already was preparing a true king. He told him, go to the house of Jesse, there I have found a king for myself. I found a man according to my own heart. Because it is by the means of the confession of the faith of our heart stating who God is to us in Christ Jesus and what God has done in Christ Jesus, God received the required basis or grounds to join the battle for our earthly bodies in order to shame the old person by the power of his redemption and forever cast him out into hell with noise. We turned and we looked at the character of the prayer psalm of David, how it contains three parts, where we see an example of the character of legal prayer or legitimate prayer. The first part identified the condition or state of David's heart as a warrior in prayer. The condition of his heart were legitimate grounds for his prayer. God is always looking at the altar. First, the altar needs to be built. This, these are your correct motives, your correct goals. Your conscience need, needs to be clean from, dead's wor from dead works, and God's law needs to be put there. This is the altar. The second part reveals the consistency of legitimate prayer, the offering the, uh, that is brought upon the altar that is sanctified. And the altar will be most holy, and anyone that anything that place, is placed upon this altar will be most holy. Offerings were put upon this altar that weren't yet holy. Holy are, was that sheep or that lamb that was separated from the pure group, pure flocks, and placed upon the altar to God. This is the one that became holy. It became God's food. This is one that is separated from his nation, from the house of his father, and from his corrupt desire and will. He's separated from these. And so the second part reveals the consistency of legitimate prayer, which gave God the basis to deliver David from the hand of all of his enemies. And the third part describes the prayer, the prayer battle itself, which surpasses the comprehension of the regular human mind. Everything that God does for us and with us, he does by the faith of our heart, the confessions of the faith of our heart. God's faith, not just faith, there's uh, the faith of man and there's the faith of God. And we know that God's faith is the word of God, faith is from hearing the word of God, and our faith is obedience, but not all have listened to this report as it is written in scripture. In a specific format, we've already looked at the first part and stopped to study the second part, which reveals the consistency of legitimate prayer in the eight names of God Most High.
There are a lot more of them, but David here brought forth eight names, and we know the number eight is the uh, number of the covenant. He brought forth these eight names, and in these eight names we see all of the names of God. We need to know that too. And before we confess our promised lot that is contained in the names of God, it is necessary to know the essence of these names with our heart by being instructed in the faith. What wealth is contained in these names how do we use them? How do we collaborate with them? Because getting to know and confessing the power contained in the heart of David in the eight following names of God allowed David to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, to be saved from his enemies. And for God, discovering the truth, revealing the power of his names in the heart of David provided God grounds to use his abilities that consist in these eight names to battle against the enemies of David. We need to present the power of these names as the faith that is within our heart the power of these names and then God will take the power of these names they become alive they become uh, active because we grow them we grow these in our heart and we watch how they grow and only when the fruit comes or arrives we begin to see that something has happened with us there where we used to stumble and fall we walk by calmly and are, we don't have any reaction to we are surprised of ourselves before I stumbled here always before I became very angry in this situation but now there's no anger or no stumbling Psalm 18 1 through 3 I will love you O Lord my strength the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemies Psalm 18 1 through 3 the Lord is my strength the Lord is my rock the Lord is my fortress the Lord is my deliverer the Lord is my shield the Lord is the horn of my salvation and the Lord is my stronghold in a specific format as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith we already looked at the lot of our inheritance in the power contained in the strength as the name of God most high and we'll turn to look at our lot in the power of a rock as the name of God most high that in inner consistency contains unearthly hardness or strength that is inherent to the nature of our Heavenly Father and is not something that can be comprehended by the abilities of the simple human mind. We note that this nature of prayer where David confesses his inherited lot in the existing names of God Most High is a purposed uh, teaching and his purpose to be called to be a calling and mantle of a king, priest, and prophet anointed by the Holy Spirit to rule over their earthly body. And if a person is not anointed to reign over his calling in the form of his earthly body, then this prayer is not for him. It will not be useful to him. Our calling is to rule over our bodies and not chase and shame the Lord and tell people repent God loves you when in your body the stronghold of life will reign you will see what will happen with these people you will not need to go to them they themselves will come to you you will not have time to eat you will try to hide from them to just get some rest you see what they did uh, when Jesus walked on the earth he hid himself from men because crowds crowds followed and looked for him but he hid himself so that he can get some rest and as Jesus would tell his disciples go and get some rest therefore the quality and vocabulary identifying hardness or rock 
that we have been talking about has nothing to do with those definitions of the word existing that is existing in the dictionaries of the world, as this rock or hardness is an identification and specification that belongs exclusively to the quality and nature of God. In Scripture, the definition of the word rock as it relates to that natural quality of God Most High is painted with the following shades and such definitions. Rock is resistant, strong, healthy, wise, tested or tried, rooted, well-established, immovable, constant, endless, continual, fearless, or unpenetrating for sin, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Here is the quality and character of the word as something hard as it pertains to the name of God Most High and is found in scripture in the following forms. Rock, cliff, inch, a measuring wreath or a rod, something heavy, weight, and scales means a specific weight by which you can determine the price and virtue of the weight individual or item when they uh, take uh, golden or silver vessels, they have different weight, uh, they weigh differently and they weigh them and according to the weight of the silver or gold, they pour something into it um, or due, due to this weight or according to that weight you receive your reward all vessels God doesn't have vessels in heaven that are of wood or clay or, ro or stone but only gold and silver vessels only here there are vessels that are also that are other than silver or gold. Because a golden vessel is a person in whose body the kingdom of heaven reigns, in his body, not in his spirit, but in his body. Those of clay are the, a vessel or a body of a person that that ha the stronghold of death Итак, reigns in their body. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? This means that this is not talking about physical mountains or physical hills. There are people that, in the eyes of God, are his mountains and his hills because a hill is always a covenant upon a hill and upon a mountain so upon a mountain a law is given in the hills or upon the hills a covenant is made who has directed the spirit of the Lord or, ha or as his counsel who has taught him with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding infants in Christ behold the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales look he, li he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. Isaiah 40, 12 through 15. In this way, an inherited lot within the power of the name of God, Rock, contains the ability of the Most High to judge, measure, or weigh upon the scales of his godly justice all the made by him creation in order to reward or punish each according to their weight. All of these uh, uh, measuring tools, he 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 are are his people. These measuring tools are his uh, his people, and so these weights and these uh, scale bowls or scale uh, plates that you measure upon are his people. Daniel 5:24 through 28. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written: Mene Mene Takel. 
for sin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And so God used Daniel as his scale. According to this information, to be clothed into the power of the rock of the Lord is to be clothed into the fear of the Lord, which is wisdom that comes from above, giving us the ability to judge or to weigh upon the scale plates of the Lord ourselves as well as those people that we are responsible for. You shall test yourself whether you're in the faith it says in scripture but how do you test yourself how do you weigh yourself when the preached word is spoken when these scales are given we receive them and weigh ourselves you shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light you shall not have in your house differing measures a large and a small you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your day may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who behave unrighteously, are an abomination to the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 25, 13 through 16. When we pervert the truth for the benefit of the flesh, we are an abomination to the Lord. Scales or scale bowls or scale plates of the Lord consisting in his name rock is, abs is his absolute p power and his ability uh, identified as his wisdom to justly judge or weigh all made by him creation so that each one that is weighed upon these plates of these scales receives his reward according to his weight. And again, this could be a reward or punishment. Weights of the Most High are commandments and statutes of the Most High, according to which he judges or weighs upon the scale plates of his justice, the made by him creation. Therefore, to possess the power of the Most High, contained in his name Rock, is to possess power to the right to judge yourself as well as those people that we are responsible for within the boundaries of the commandments and statutes of the Lord. And this also means to weigh your words and actions upon the scale plates of justice of the Most High as well as the words and actions of those people that we, we carry responsibility for. And again, not all men, but only those that are under our responsibility. A man of the flesh thinks he can judge everyone and he can evaluate everyone and everything. But the righteous, they only weigh themselves and those that are under their responsibility and so that's why the one righteous may be heavier and the other lighter for one he may allow to judge cities countries another to judge only himself and his for example his family his children or those saints that are that he uh, tends or assists the pastor to tend the flocks to be an Episcopal. A person that helps the pastor is one, a person that helps the pastor one to, uh, is an Episcopal. For some reason, people have decided and uh, uh, deacons and Episcopals, they have the same service, just different purposes. For some reason, some people have decided to uh, uh, ascribe this name to the apostles truly an apostle is always an episcopal and deacon but episcopal and deacon are not always an apostle but for some reason people they've removed their name apostle and have put episcopal as someone that is at the top level and so to master and be clothed into the earthly quality of a rock 
or unearthly quality of a rock contained in the name of God Most High, which quenches our hunger and thirst and bring us to power over our calling, we came to the necessity to look at four classical questions. First, what in essence is a rock as it pertains to the power of the name of God Most High? Second, what purpose is the quality of a rock called to fulfill in our prayers obtained by us and the power of the name of God Most High as our rock? Third, what price do we need to pay in order to be clothed into the quality of a rock contained in the name of God Most High as our rock and forth by what results do we need to judge that we truly possess the virtue of a rock contis- consisting in the power of the name of God Most High as our rock. I will remind us that all the names of God Most High are diluted in one the other come one from the other and demonstrate one dem- demonstrate the one in the other empower one the other and identify the truthful nature of one the other. Therefore in the given psalm of David, there are eight names of the Most High presented in a sequence where each following name comes from the previous to it name and is a demonstration of the previous name or the previous identifies itself in the next name. In a specific format, we've already looked at three components of rock. In the essence of the first question and short formulations, I will remind us of them and we will then continue our study. First, the virtue of the quality of a rock is one of the names of God, as well as one of the inherent to God, to God nature, qualities and characteristics. Second, the virtue of the quality of a rock is one of the names of the Son of God as well as one of his qualities inherent to him as God. Third, the virtue of the quality of a rock is the power of God that comes out of the mouth of God as well as the Holy Spirit being the inspirer and accomplisher of his word spoken by the mouth of God's prophets. And fourth, the virtue of the quality of a rock is an eternal covenant that God has made with us in Christ in his death and in David. He has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase for he had made an everlasting covenant it says the symbol of King David is to be seen in the virtue of a king priest and prophet in the form of our new person in Jesus Christ that has grown into full measure of growth in Christ who possessed the ability to rule over his body and over his soul within the boundaries of the solid covenant or the secure covenant that is not able to be altered. Remember, God has made this covenant with a king and not just any man. And when people convince you that you are a royal priesthood, you need to to tell them you will be a royal priesthood when you will be grown into full measure of growth in Christ, when you will leave uh, the spiritual infancy, when, when you stop looking at a mirror dimly, as it is written. And if the quality of a rock which identifies the essence of the eternal covenant in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ measures the relationship of God with man and man with God in Christ Jesus who rules over his body and over his soul within the boundaries of the solid or secure rock, then the solid covenant in the word unalterable means that this covenant is absolutely required or one that is not under any circumstance able to be to or po- is possible to break or change out. When a man makes a covenant with God in the death of the Lord Jesus, he dies for his nation, for the house of his father, and for his corrupt desires, which provides God the proper grounds to adopt with his redemption our body to accomplish according to his desire his unchanging will contained in his covenant with man. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determined to show more abundantly to their heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation 
who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Hebrews 6, 16 through 19. We've talked about this more than once. The two immutable things are two immutable truths in the eternal covenant assured and immutable in which it is impossible to, for God to lie and by which the hope of our calling is weighed and measured. This is the brought behind the veil into the temple of our spirit that is born from the seed of the uh, preached word of truth blood of the covenant and the broken body of the Lord Jesus, those twelve cakes that quench the hunger and thirst of God. Only this goes behind the veil. The blood and the cakes are brought in behind the veil that are constantly before God and reveals itself in the eternal covenant assured and immutable in scripture in three identifying components. First, the covenant of blood second the covenant of salt third the covenant of peace we need to take into consideration that the threefold covenant between god and man are not legitimate if they are not together if one is without the other as they pursue one goal fulfilling different purposes to obtain one specific purpose in God. The final goal of the assured covenant you have with God, this threefold covenant, the purpose of it is, by the power of the law of the Spirit of life, to weigh and measure a person in the virtue of a king as a king, priest, and prophet and to give him victory from his old person. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plague. I, o grave, I will put your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. Hosea 13:14. There is no church that is... Uh, uh, and there is no Ephesian church or a Portland church or any other church. There's the Church of Jesus Christ that is in every country and every place. Church of Jesus Christ. In any city and any place. And so sometimes people ask, what church are you from? And then when you tell them, they say, oh, this is, so you're a church of uh, Portland or a church of a different city. And so they try to title it by the city that you're in. And they, according to their cities, group together. They don't unite as the Church of Jesus Christ, but those that belong to that only that specific city, and every city has their own uh, uh, differences, and they became very obvious. There, we were in different republics, different places, but uh, <clears throat> but we still were able to keep in contact with each other here. They've uh, literally divided up the people uh, according to their cities. And so this unique prophecy it says that I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from death, O death, I will be your plague. This is a unique prophecy that belongs to the door of our hope. Apostle Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, talks about the body of man. God has taken the obligation to destroy the stronghold of death within our body by the stronghold of life. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. What does it mean when it says corruptible? That means our body, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, that part of the soul that connects with the body is mortal, but that part of the soul that connects with the spirit is immortal. So that we understand in scripture sometimes the soul is uh, mentioned in a mortal form and the soul in other places is mentioned as immortal. 
there is again mortal and immortal so our soul is the middleman that links our spirit with our body and so here where it says mortal is talking about the body uh, we live but our, our body is mortal as soon as we, we be, were born it begins to already uh, age this is uh, years or a age that means uh, getting older if you leave or if you remove this mortal state you won't have age so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory every time we read these places of scripture we need to understand them well O death where is your sting O Hades where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ he took this place uh, from Hosea he practically brought forth the words of prophet Hosea where he says O death where is your sting O Hades where is your victory he already thanks God here for something that isn't in his body yet and never will be because he did not live till the time that God would be doing this and he died not having uh, received this perfection so that we so that they without us would not have uh, received this perfection or, because if that would have happened the time would have already ended but the scriptures say they died in faith not having received what was promised so that they without us would not have achieved this perfection the perfection where in our body the stronghold of eternal life will reign when God will erect the stronghold of life he will do it in us as well as them at the same time at this moment at this time the resurrection of the, of the dead will happen and those who died in the faith in this promise and with this promise they before us will resurrect already in their new bodies and we will still be in our bodies and we will be for a specific time amount of time together with them waiting for Christ when he will come and take them and us fifth the virtue of the rock is the church of the living God identified as the pillar and ground of the truth but if I am delayed I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth an organic membership of the house of God is identified by us being within the order of God and the order of the body which identifies within the house of God the order of the kingdom of heaven that is the theocracy of God which we see as the function of the human body which is a symbol of the body of Christ if you pay attention when people begin to complain how is it that one person who knows where he will lead us we need to control him if you inspect and control him that means you're greater than this person you need to then take his place here the people control uh, uh, the president for example if for what if the president they say uh, loses his mind or becomes sick so we need to then uh, take measures and so 
What will happen if the head is not healthy or the brain is not healthy? What can the rest of the body do? They can't come together and take control. But if God in his body has placed one person, one head, God carries responsibility for that head. When God places one, he won't allow such a situation that a person that is mentally unstable would be leading his people. We need to trust in God that God gives to us and that he protects. The problem is not the person that he placed. Uh, uh, the problem is not in the person that is placed. Uh, but God, if you trust God, but it's God, there's no problems because God does not place somebody with an illness. And so Jesus had said these words through Apostle John. Those who receive you receive me, and those who receive me receive the one who sent me. And those who reject you reject me, the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. <coughs> and there's the result. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to the blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of, a, of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure what was commanded and if so much as a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow and so terrifying and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said I am exceedingly afraid and trembling the church of the living God is again the pillar and ground of the truth it says here that you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem to the mountain that for you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all to the spirit of just men made perfect so Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel see that you do not refuse him who speaks and when I read this the sentence here I always want to uh, capitalize the S in speaks because it is important for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on spoke on earth much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth but now he has promised saying yet once more I shake not only the earth but also heaven now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 18 through 29. Sixth, the virtue of the quality of a rock is given is the given path or way of the Lord purpose for the upright one the way of the Lord is strength for the upright but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity Proverbs 10 29 and so in our mind we imagine then different ways or paths either of asphalt or uh, different types of uh, maybe trails but this is a route or is a direction to a goal that God has placed this is not something that's a path uh, that's laid but a goal a purpose that God places the pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid 
It's written in Psalm 18.4. And when we're talking about the route of the Lord, it's not going to be a smooth, a clean and smooth and convenient path that you will walk, but it will have many uh, barriers that you would have to, you will have to overcome. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Psalm 18.4.5. The path of the Lord is a route that has uh, swamps and disappo disappointment and difficulty. They'll have deep rivers that have that are fast and inconvenient. And these are false, the fa false charismatic uh, teachings. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I, I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Psalm 69, 2. The Holy Spirit had revealed that these uh, fast moving rivers are this charismatic movements. Uh, that uh, where people behave very inappropriately and uh, behave sometimes as monkeys within the church. And so the phrase, the way of the Lord is a way for the upright, means that the way of the Lord is an example of a measurement and or is a type of measurement and weight. Thus says the Lord, stand in the way and see, and ask for the old path where the good way is, and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls, but they said, we will not walk in it. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet, but they said that we will not listen. Therefore hear, O nations, and know, O congregations, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded the words, nor my law, but rejected it. Jeremiah 6, 16 through 19. According to this place of scripture that is uh, written by Christ, addressed to his students, to his nation, the way of the Lord is the goal of God that is placed for us. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. Psalm 89, 15-17. Specifically, these two components we see here as the goals that are placed by God for us, we see this in our ability to be weighed upon the scales of justice. The virtue of the quality of a rock is a person that possesses wisdom that comes from above. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Being in perfect peace is obtained by the obedience of a person to the commandments of God that is called to sanctify and show him the right way or right path. According to this place of scripture, a person that possesses a calm spirit is one that is weighed upon the skills of justice, who has hope upon God and provides God the basis to keep and protect this person in perfect peace, relying upon the Lord is also revealed in the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord is the wisdom of God that we see in God's quality of a rock or the quality of a rock. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. According to this place of scripture, we see the ability of the Son of God in the flesh when he was in the flesh to judge not by the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears was 
the was the quality of his spirit that came and had the strength of the heavenly father and was able to free he was able to free people from the slavery of sin and death therefore if the son makes you free you shall be free indeed I know that you are Abraham's descendants but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you I speak what I have seen with my father and you do and you do what you have seen with your father John 8 36 through 38 so practically we've looked at the first question and if I begin the first que the second question then this first uh, if we begin uh, the second question we won't be able to finish it of course today and I don't want to uh, go through this too quickly so that we need to be able to understand it in more detail we get used to uh, detail understanding and if we go too fast and bring forth too much information it begins harder to understand everything that uh, and so again uh, we've practiced this and we know how uh, the sermons work as you get to used to say waking up at 6 in the morning going to sleep at 10 p.m. your your body would be set to those things why I'm saying this is be when you practice something uh, we are used to the way it is so let us dedicate the re remaining time that we have to pray который Господь раскрывает нам в имени твердыня. Небесный Отец, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ again and again, I thank you for this privilege, for this joy, to proclaim your mercy and truth upon this place and worship together with your saints, unite together in thanksgiving and joy and in trembling before your word to confess the faith of our heart that you are alive, you are our stronghold and you will bring us to the victory you so desire. This is your will and you're vigilant over your words that you have magnified in the temple of our body above all of your names. You wanted that man rely upon your word and that it's not his emotions or his emotional self would rule over him and not based upon his emotions and feelings that he decide whether he's free from sin or not received this promise or he didn't receive this promise that he only make this decision or determine this by the information that he hears and receives this information that came from the unseen that holds this earth in place by your word by your information you hold this world together and you also judge this world according to your word you have said that you need we need to receive this information your truth and confess this truth confessing what we receive by hearing your truth we prepare the conditions that you need so that you can fulfill your word that you have con uh, spoken for us you have no other way this is the only way that you have offered to us we thank you that you have shown us the difference between idle confessions and confessions that are of faith when we confess your will learning that this will is yours we thank you and you received them the basis to fulfill this promise for us these last days have come the earth is performing its last turns and the universe will soon disappear once and for all time will be swallowed up in eternity 
at the end of this time, you have decided to return to us the vineyards and the valley of Accor, so that we may rejoice as the nation and Israelite nation rejoiced when they came out of Egypt, when they were freed from slavery of Egypt and were healed and you enriched them and they took all of the riches of Egypt. I thank you that before you take your bride to yourself, you will do the work that you did with the nation of Israel. You will lead your church out from the slavery of sin. She will become free from sin. She will be free from all political systems of the world. She will be free from the power and dependence of her nation, free from the power of her house, the house of her father, free from the corrupt desires of the soul and at this time you will heal all illnesses and weaknesses in man because you will destroy the corruption and aging that is in man that prompt all of these illnesses and weaknesses you will show the world the reign that you have within the body and your kingdom in the body your kingdom is in our spirit and those who have renewed their mind it is also in their mind now too but when you will finally build your kingdom in our body something unusual will happen then rapture will be close and after that your millennial reign we thank you that this time has come near the world in its political world is preparing to build or rebuild, reform the previous Roman Empire. Right now, the Antichrist can't reveal himself, although his time has come, because you have not taken from the midst his midst, your, your church, and he can't reveal himself until she is raptured from the earth. All needs to be prepared in that way and we thank you for that revelation that we have received it by faith your promise in the seed of the word and it is growing within us and when the time comes you will perform your work this miracle this joy and we will rejoice before you being obedient to your word we will consider ourselves dead to sin living for you call the not existent as existent we do this today and not looking at our emotions that are not always following what we what we tell them we don't pay attention to that and we confess that the stronghold of death is destroyed within our body and in its place the stronghold of life is built and we thank you and when we thank you you take these words and you create your stronghold within us this stronghold is getting stronger by day hope is growing by day and the closer the promise is to us the stronger our hope is and the clearer our goal and we thank you for your inheritance that you have chosen and have drawn near to yourself that they have obeyed your word that they have not begun looking at their abilities but your abilities because all that you will do you will do by the power of your Holy Spirit and not our abilities and everything that is impossible for us is possible for you and we have believed in this we worship before you and we rejoice before you and may your greatness be a blessing in your nation that today for hell is already a danger even today for the synagogues of Satan is a threat that you have bound in their own sheaves their own bundles and today they're afraid and 
and, and hate. They can make up whatever they want. They can consider us dead, but we are alive. And we thank you for that privilege, for that joy. May your mercy be magnified for us now and forever, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 